Okay, uh, we will begin uh, the session then. All right, so um, hello to everyone from Nagaland and welcome to Dot Talks live uh, from home with me, Elika. I will be your host and moderator for today's talk. Now, this is the 10th lecture of the Dot Talks uh, webinar series. And our speaker for today is uh, Dr. Mohammed Shafiq K. Uh, he has completed his PhD from the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. And his research interests include uh, visual cultures, migration studies, and minor literature. I'd like to warmly welcome my friend Shafiq to this Dot Talks lecture series and for accepting our invitation. Uh, presently, he is an assistant professor at Manipal Center for Humanities, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. He has previously worked at the University of Hyderabad and the Central University of Kerala. Uh, now, Shavik has been uh, researching on, as he tells me, on amateur photographs and the methods he's applied to his studies has been from a uh, cultural anthropology and cultural studies point, uh, point of view. So his talk for today is titled, uh, The Visible and the Invisible, How to Study a Photograph, uh, in which he will be sharing with us some of the existing <clears throat> and new methods on studying and conducting um, an ethnography of photography. Uh, I would like to give the time to you, Shafiq. Uh, please take it forward, but let me share the screen, okay? okay yeah, um, thank you, uh, Elika. Uh, thanks also, uh, Kulo, uh, for inviting me uh, for this talk. So yeah, there is the presentation there. Uh, today I'll be um, looking at uh, photography as a popular art form. <clears throat> Okay, so this picture that you see is actually me. Uh, this picture was uh, taken sometime in 1991. And uh, behind me, you see the city of Abu Dhabi uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I grew, I mean, I spent some uh, few years there and this picture was taken uh, on one of those days. Now, this picture is a very good example uh, as to what can go wrong. Uh, when we take photograph as a document of reality. <clears throat> we'll uh, discuss this more uh, with detail too. I mean, I'll be borrowing a lot from Christopher Pinney. Uh, but before that, if you look at this picture, uh, it gives the impression that uh, I live in this place, but I did not. Uh, the fact is that we lived uh, some 200 kilometers away uh, from the nearest city. So the city that you see behind me actually exists. Yes, that way it is an indexical, uh, of an indexical nature. But uh, I did not live there. I was, we were visiting someone and uh, I remember we were visiting my uncle. And uh, it was taken uh, from the balcony of the place that he works uh, at. So um, the thing about photograph is that it is a visual document, but it hides a lot of information. A lot of information there is invisible in the photograph. Like what are some of these uh, invisible things in a photograph? For example, uh, I mean, the most obvious thing is that there is an outside to the frame. A photograph is a framed thing. There's an outside to the frame. You do not know what is on the other sides, what is uh, behind. Oh, I mean, who is taking the photo, for example, we do not know. Uh, what is on the left, what is on the right, we do not know. We also do not know the range of photographs that were taken along with this photograph. I mean, usually, if you look at our social media, for example, if you look at family albums, for example, um, you know, when we were children, uh, we used to have these films, right? So uh, the studio would ask us, so once they develop the negative, the studio would ask us, which of these negatives do you actually want to uh, print? Because you know, not all photographs were good looking, not all photographs were developed. 
So obviously, we do not see the range of photographs that were taken uh, along with the photograph. So that is another invisibility of the photograph. The third invisibility of the photograph, and this is the most important when it comes to uh, looking at photograph as a realistic, as a visual document of truth, of reality, is that photographs are generally of, I mean, I'm looking at amateur photography here, are generally of happy occasions. Uh, you have uh, you have photographs which are you have photographs which are uh, of birthdays. You have photographs when you go for a tour. We have photographs uh, when you graduate. You have photographs of all the happy occasions in your life. But we do not have photographs of the sad occasions in our life. So in order to look at a photograph as if it is a document of reality, would be looking at a very limited version of that reality. And this limited version is, is usually of the happy occasions in our life. So uh, obviously, I mean, today we know, especially in the age of social media, that you know only a very limited, very selected range of photographs ever get exhibited. But when photography came in, so uh, Elika, we'll have the next slide. So yeah, if you look at, uh, for the last uh, couple of years, I've been working on um, photographs which were taken by uh, migrant workers in the Gulf. So these are some of the, I mean, I just made a collage of the different photos that I have collected. And uh, as you can see, um, they are all male, um, you know, um, one of the things that I face when I study these photographs is that, you know, these are, I mean, many of them are more are like, you know, moldy and uh, because our weather is very humid here, photographs really do not last for a long time. Um, also, you can see that, uh, the other problem with these photographs are that they are actually part of the domestic space in the sense that, uh, you know, that today we post a lot of photographs, but it's a new thing. Uh, photographs are generally uh, hidden in some rack in these houses, in some albums. You have to have, and this is one major thing about studying photographs, which is that you have to be some kind of an insider to study photographs. Um, if you look at Christopher Quinney, for example, many of his, I mean, I'll come to his uh, study later on, but I'm just giving an example. Many of his uh, photographs actually come from, are sourced from the studio rather than from people themselves. Uh, because, you know, it's a source where you can get, but otherwise, when you go to a house, you actually have, have to have access uh, to the house in order to get these photographs. You also, because, you know, there, there are um, many of these um, restrictions which are there, I mean, which are culturally specific, which are attached to the gaze. Like, you know, just like how you cannot have access to all the rooms in a house, you can also not have access to everything that can be seen by the eyes. In the sense, for example, um, family photographs usually have uh, people uh, who are not there anymore, who, people who have passed on. And uh, not everyone will be comfortable uh, showing those photographs to a stranger. Um, family photographs also uh, will have photographs that were taken inside the house and not in public places and were not really meant to be seen uh, by outsiders. Uh, and, uh, you know, families usually have a problem when someone else comes and sees it. Okay, so before I get to that, um, if you look at the history of photographs, uh, photograph was not really looked at as an art until, um, you know, the second, until um, the mid 20th century. But if you look at it, there's a hundred years uh, history of photograph before that. Um, the photographs, I mean, the film photographs were developed in late uh, 19th century, I think 1890s or something, by Eastman Color, and then soon after that Kodak. But before that, you have this, what is called the daguerreotype from 1839. So you have actually a long history of photographs, but the reason why it was not studied as an art is because it was more seen as a physical activity. 
um, it is seen the thing about a uh, photograph is that it is already mediated now someone like walter benjamin would say that that is its positive potential that is its democratic potential but you know i mean the reason why he is saying is that you know i mean he has another agenda to it but i won't go there if you look at um, how photographs were used in its early history it was as if photographs have this unmediated access to reality while the fact is that you know uh, photograph is very mediated in the sense that there is a machine which comes in between you and the world when you take a photograph so uh, in the next slide uh, you will see that so this uh, this is coming from christopher pinay's book um, camera indica 1997 book which actually uh, is representative of the shift that has happened in uh, cultural anthropology when it comes to photographs so he is giving this as an example of how photos were used in um, early photography in india so this is so after the 1857 revolt um, see it was in the 1860s uh, that uh, camera uh, like photographs became really popular around that time for example the british royal family ordered some 600 photographs of themselves uh, at that point of time photographs became this um, new machine that can record reality so uh, pinay says that after 1857 photographs were used for two um, purposes first of which was detection by detection now this has got to do with um, like you know in, the, in those times there was this field of anthropometry where you can look at people's uh, physical characteristics and tell uh, you know and speak about their mental properties so after 57 1857 the british um, in india were quite um, paranoid let's say because you know the 1857 revolt was um, as you know it was a revolt by their own soldiers so it was completely um, out of the blue and therefore they were paranoid so they employed camera to photograph the different uh, castes and tribes in india and these photographs were used to study their bodies so if you look at these photographs uh, one is the left one is a baniya uh, trader and the uh, right one is a banjara uh, tribe what they used to do is that they used to make these people pose as if they are doing their traditional activities so the baniya is a uh, uh, baniya is running a shop uh, while the banjara uh, is just i mean he's just sitting there and then based on these photographs so you uh, for the banjara you also have a specimen of man and woman so based on this they used to say okay this tribe we can trust or this tribe okay you know it would be like you know look at their nose uh, they are untrustworthy uh, it it was that kind of uh, science that was going on at that point of time so they would say um, they would look at these photographs and they would uh, have this detailed catalog of people based on their past experience uh, like you know in 1857 it is obviously not a straight forward story there were so many people uh, in india who supported the british and there were so many people in india who were opposed to the british now uh, british going by their um, racist uh, ideology they they obviously mapped this onto races races and tribes so like you know which tribe can you trust which tribe can you not trust which caste can you trust and all of this was supposed to be mapped onto their body like you know it was as if your body can say what you are actually now the second um, function of photograph which is in the next slide is that of uh, preservation now if you look at this photograph again taken from uh, christopher pinay's book uh, you will see these girls so they are um, they represent some tribe in andaman here now the sad fact about this photograph is that all these girls actually used to attend the english school they used to be uh, properly uniformed they used to be like you and me but the photographer um, made them um, you know wear whatever of oh, these things that they are wearing uh, in order to make this photo of like you know this real document of a tribe 
Now, this was preservation because after 1857, the British also realized that the older ways of life are fast eroding. There is a new social order and we have to preserve the past. So the people were made to dress up as if they were past. So in cultural anthropology, especially in visual anthropology, uh, you will see that until the 1970s, more or less, photographs were considered uh, to be a true representation of reality such that um, like there is this uh, famous example of uh, Margaret Mead. Um, she would ask her subjects like, you know, so there is a mother uh, feeding a baby. But the thing is, because uh, the light was not clear enough, she would ask her subject to not feed her baby and wait for adequate light to come and then feed her baby. The sat, I mean, and then she would have this explanation that, you know, but because the baby is hungry, the mother would obviously be thinking of feeding the baby. And therefore you cannot say that it is a post photograph. So this kind of realist effect, or, you know, if it is actually a post photograph, they would write this is a post photograph. It was as if, um, you know, there was some kind of direct connection between what uh, the camera can capture and what it is in reality, which is that, I mean, there was some kind of connection uh, that they assumed that, you know, that one can capture reality as it is. Okay. Now, so one of the major things, uh, so obviously, as part of this entire debate, you can see that the, the major point uh, between uh, photograph and reality was that, uh, you know, I mean, everyone believed photograph to be worth for their indexical nature, indexical in the sense to show what it is in reality. Okay. Now, Christopher Pinney, uh, so in the next slide, uh, so Christopher Pinney looks at uh, photographs in India. If you look at the title of his book, of his book, it is interesting because he says the social life of Indian photographs. He does not say the social life of photographs in India, by which he means that the Indian photographs are a thing in itself, in the sense that it follows a different order that is rooted in. Indian dealings with the visual. So he puts forward uh, two important theories. Um, one is that of Darshan. By Darshan, uh, what so basically in Western photographic theories, the idea is that the person who looks is the powerful person as opposed to the object which is looked, which is a like, you know, which is in a position of uh, weakness. Now, the idea behind Darshan is that this particular equation is reversed, which is that the person who looks at the deity, at the God's picture, possesses his power because the power is given through the God who looks back at him. So in voyeurism, in the Western theory of voyeurism, the power comes because you look at a person and the person does not see that you are here, you are looking at that person. Like, you know, for example, uh, peeping Tom, the power of peeping Tom is that the person who is being peeped at does not know that, you know, there is this person who is looking. While in the idea of Darshan, the idea is that the person knows and because the person looks back at you, it increases your power. So the direction of power is changed in a, um in an indian photograph that is one point but that uh he obviously he connects it to a uh, hindu tradition now the second point what he calls is the surfaceism surfaceism surface which is that when you study indian photographs you should not look at the semiotic you should not look at the meanings because the indian photographs do not operate in meanings but what he calls um, surface, on the surface, surfacism. So if you look at the photograph, which is there on the slide right now, uh, he says that this is a very good example of surfacism, but it is what he calls an interocularity. Interocularity is a word which is like intertextuality. 
uh, which is that uh, you know one uh, text i mean just like one text can appear in another text for example there is a, a reference to one movie with another movie uh, similarly i mean interocularity is when one kind of visual is being referred to in in another visual for example uh, here the photograph is clearly designed after uh, amitabh bachchan's uh, angry young man so in order to make sense of this photograph you have to already have a prior understanding of this angry young man phenomena like you know uh, this this person who is dejected with life and who wants to overthrow the existing systems all of that will come into the picture but you know it is not it is not in the uh, you know in any object in the picture but it is rather in the uh, in the surface of the picture itself how uh, for example the montage is done uh, as if to resemble an amitabh bachchan movie okay now if you uh, if you look at christopher pinney but again it is a work of a uh, cultural anthropology now if you go to the next slide you have the example from stuart hall who uh, unlike pinney is looking at his own community so this picture that you have here this photograph um, is taken from his essay reconstruction work uh, it is about one of those uh, black migrants who came from caribbean uh, to england now if you look at this uh, studio it's a studio photograph and it's obviously absurd in the sense that uh, the uh, the telephone does not for example is not connected to anywhere it is just a telephone it is just a stylized picture but stuart hall would say that rather than reading this within the genre of studio photographs within the genre of portrait photography what you have to read it is actually for what it means to the person uh like you know you have to think from the uh from the perspective of the person and for that person most probably this picture would be sent back home by post and the function of that photograph is to show first that he is alive that he has made the ship journey in one piece and secondly he is doing all right so this is the uh, this is the point of experience coming into studying photographs which is that so when when i go back like you know when i study um, migrant photography uh, and i study those migrant photography from the 80s and 90s it is not a world which is not completely uh, unknown which is complete i mean it is not a world which is completely unknown to me i know something of that world though i cannot assume that i know it totally so if you come to next part, uh, next slide you will have a uh, Tina Combs a uh, very interesting book on black photography in England as she is also looking at this uh, caribbean migrants who came to england and uh, she is looking at the, those photographs which has which have come from these uh, ghettoized uh, places uh, in england and she is saying that these photographs should never should not be read for what you can see in the photograph rather it is only a person who belongs to the community which he does who can read it for what the photograph is quietly saying which is that uh you know i mean it all looks like happy photographs but these photographs have very difficult histories behind them these people have very difficult histories behind them the people in the neighborhood know what kind of people these are and it is only by that quiet listening so she uses this idea of quietness which is that every photograph has a quiet frequency you have to listen to it in your solitude you have to listen to it with your insider's experience and it is only then that these photographs will speak to you so uh, she says so uh, if you if you compare uh, christopher pinney and uh, Tina Kant so Christopher Pinney uses the word aspiration uh, for uh, you know i mean he look for example Christopher Pinney uh, recalls this episode he goes to Chandni Chowk and there he sees a studio and in front of the studio there are lots of photographs people uh, who have posed with Amir Khan who has posed with Anil Kapoor you know obviously these are all um, 
you know, I mean, these are all uh, fabricated photographs. But the, he says that this is how photographs are used, which is that they aspire. This is this, he's, he calls this the chamber of dreams. Photographs are chamber of dreams. Now, Tina Kant or, or also uses a similar phrase. She says, these are future conditionals, which is that one of the function which photograph does for precarious communities is that they already live in the present what they want to be in the future which is that um, you know when your survival is not really guaranteed or your when your freedom is not really guaranteed you would want to be now for the photograph what you would like to be in the future so you know people dressing up uh, as uh, fashionable people, people dressing up as people who are doing uh, really good in their lives. Uh, she says this is a future conditionals, like in the sense that this is what they want their future to be, but obviously they are not really uh, sure whether this future will at all happen, which is why, uh, which is how you have to read this photograph, not as a document of the present, but as a document of a possible future, a conditional future. Okay, now I go to my last uh, slide here and we are already uh, nearing our time. This is an interesting study uh, by Ariella Azule, she's an Israeli um, of artist as well as someone who theorizes on photographs. So she calls photography ontologically civil. Civil in the sense, um, I mean, what what she means by civil is what we in our ordinary, con I mean, regular conversation, we mean democratic, which is that what she says is that see when French Revolution happened, for example, the kind of republic which came to be was completely outside the imagination. Like it would have taken a leap of imagination to think that everyone who is in a particular um, region can have a say about their future together and arrive at a consensus as to some kind of consensus, which is always destabilized, which is always slippery as to how their country can be run. She says a photograph is actually this kind of photograph in itself. So she's not saying that, you know, a photograph as it is in a particular cultural context. She's saying photograph in itself is a civil document in the sense that there are too many people involved in a photograph. For example, I mean, you know, traditionally we say the photographer, the object, the camera and the audience. But she says that the photographer has an audience. The subject in the photograph has an audience in her mind. The subject in the photograph has their own agency. The photographer has its own intention, but the camera has its own uh, base of functioning. All of which makes a photograph into a highly unstable field, uh, which is which exists at a point of time only as a matter of consensus. Now it is always a slippery consensus. So this is the civil uh, contract of photography. So uh, coming back to uh, my study, so if you look at some of the latest uh, kind of things which happen, uh, because because photograph hides a lot, some of the recent development in studying of photography has been to use what is called photo voice or photo elicitation, which is that you uh, do not take photographs and then you know you look at the photograph, you actually ask for uh, people, so what does, what, when was this photo taken, what was it about, and anything that they would say, you do not have to restrict your conversation to the photograph, but is about what this what conversation can this photograph in, uh, generate, which does not have to be about the photograph, but all of which is actually a potential of the photograph itself. So, um, yeah, so these are the things that I want to, yeah, so that's it. Um, thank you. So this is, these are some of the methods that I've been using. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you, uh, Shafiq. And um, that was, uh, I think this is a conversation that we have been um, sort of talking about 
how do we capture, how do we understand images, how do we capture uh, notions or practices of the everyday. And I, in fact, um, uh, you know, we've had this conversation um, earlier also, and I talked about, I was asking you this, and I, I asked you to think about some around this um, idea of how, how do we, uh, you know, how do we arrive at this world system of photography? I think Christopher Binet talks about this uh, because there are so many local specificities to images, reading images. How do we uh, call out for a world system of um, reading images? Uh, or how, you know, can we arrive at a method that grasps historical in interconnectedness of practices ac across cultures? Is it even possible uh, to read photograph in that? So I think we can start the conversation uh, and we'll open up for Q&A as well, but th that is just one point that I wanted you to highlight as well. Um, now, when we open up, uh, just one point before you answer. And see, uh, when you ask your questions, you can unmute your microphone, introduce yourself and ask your questions, or you can even post uh, the questions in the chat box. I see that there is already a question there. We will take that also, uh, but perhaps, yeah, Toshafik, yeah. Yeah, uh, see, world systems in the sense that, um, so uh, the uh, idea of world systems is that the world can be divided into a center, a semi-periphery and a periphery. So the flow happens from the center <clears throat> towards the periphery. So towards the semi-periphery and then the periphery. The periphery is so peripheral at times that, you know, it never reaches there. I mean, that is the point. Now, uh, if you look at uh, how the study of literature is done, now Franco Moretti, uh, Franco Moretti has this, uh, I mean, he is the one who introduced this in the, in the reading of literature, the idea of world systems. It's actually economic. I mean, it, it comes from economics, this idea of world systems. Okay. But he says that, uh, you know, if you look at the novel form, the novel form comes from the West. It's a Western European uh, phenomenon. But you will see that towards the end of 19th century, uh, more or less, it I mean, it runs all over through the world, not in every country. For example, in Eastern Europe, it comes uh, only much later, only in the mid 20th century or something. Uh, but, you know, most of the world witnessed some kind of novel form towards the end of 19th century. Now, he says that, so the, the thing, the novel form, the idea of a novel comes from the West. But that does not mean that the novel itself is Western. Uh, it has, so he says there are three things. It has a... Uh, a foreign plot, when, when the novels first came to India, it has a foreign plot, local characters and local narrative voice. So uh, the world systems theory actually uh, allows for quite a, like, you know, uh, quite a diverse form of reading. In the sense that once you know, so how does, what is the Western thing in photography, which is that it was actually in, it was actually photography, according to Christopher Pinney, and he says this in this book, The Coming of Photography, which invoked the idea of an individual in India. See, camera can capture everything that is put. So when the British, for example, when, when they needed identification, for example, uh, it was even, you know, I mean, uh, we know that uh, even now, in many ways, we are not treated as individuals. We are rather treated as people who belong to certain communities. The kind of rule uh, which exists in India is usually the indirect rule. Like, you know, we are ruled through our communities rather than through the state in itself. But at the same time, the camera could imagine an individual without any of his other bearings. I mean, this is what we say, speak about realism, right? In the sense that in the um, in the late 18th uh, and in the 19th century, when people started painting um, farmers, for example, we did not know who they were. I mean, they were nameless individuals who existed only as individuals. Like, you know, they would, they would uh, depict scenes from everyday life. 
uh, until then it was not the case. For example, if you look at a Renaissance painting, each of the saints there, for example, one saint will have a key, one saint will have a sword. Each of these are symbols, right? So they are not supposed to be any human being. They are supposed to be a specific individual. Similarly, uh, every individual will have a marker to show that what is his social position. But you don't see it when with the coming of realism because there you um, there you depict human being as human being, not as already belonging to a particular association. Now photographs brought this technology to India, so this is the coming from the West. But as to so we have obviously we all take photographs which are of ourselves, which are of individuals. But as to how to read it, the form of the photography, as to how we will stylize it, that is very really local. So this is the world systems involved. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, there are two questions that have come in and one I think you have sort of touched upon it. Um, so the first is um, um, Yavisa has, uh, she's an MA student from the college and she's asked this question, how can we determine if an image is a staged or a real capturing of the moment? Isn't it difficult for the meaning to be interpreted? Um, along with that, we have um, sort of a related question. Uh, this, this is by Akila. And uh, she asked us, how do we read selfies? And would it be possible to read them as feminist projects? Um, OK, all right. Yes, I think we can take those two questions. Yeah, so um, see, the question should not arise in the sense that um, it doesn't matter whether a photograph is staged or real. I mean, that is precisely the point. I mean, most of our photographs are staged. Our selfies are staged. Uh, the point is that you should not think that photographs actually capture reality. I mean, that is the point. So why does it matter whether it was staged or if it is real? Because, um, I mean, when we look at amateur photography, they are usually staged. But what does it say about the culture which stages it? I mean, that is the question. I mean, as long as uh, we are not doing some kind of journalistic photography, it shouldn't really matter. I mean, in the sense that, you know, you when these awards happen at times, there are accusations of person who getting the award had actually staged the photograph and things of that sort. But unless, um, other than you know, on such occasions, it doesn't really matter because even the way we stage a photograph, like, you know, I mean, lots of people doing this and this and whatever is actually a cultural uh, code, you know? So you cannot, even the staged photograph shows a lot of reality in it because staging, all kinds of stagings are possible. Like, you know, it's, um, but if you look at all the selfies, they all belong to a very small range. Like, you know, how, um, how, how, for example, how is artificial intelligence able to detect, okay, this is this kind of photography, this is some other kind of photography. Very simply because, I mean, if you come to Manipal, I know that, okay, which are the places you will photograph. Or, you know, I mean, so, the idea of staged uh, doesn't really exist because most, mostly even staging is like, you know, I mean, just like even though the number of sentences possible in a language is infinite, we all know that the actual number of sentences that we use mostly belong to a particular small range. That is the case with photographs also. Yeah, so about the feminist project, see, the thing is, it can be used for all kinds of projects in the sense that how do you read it? Uh, how do you understand what kind of selfies is it? That is the only question, uh, you know. So it actually, it is a concrete thing to do. It's a real concrete study to do. I mean, one cannot have an abstract answer to it. In theory, yes. Okay. Uh, I see that there are um, two more questions. We can take those two together. One is uh, Yavisa, again, she asked this question. The photographs, I think it's because you touched on the topic of uh, painting. So photographs are often considered as a visual art and show various events in history and give us an idea on various communities or people, but so do paintings. Uh, so can paintings be considered an, uh, as early form of photography? Uh, we have uh, another question from Matsu, uh, an MS student. And owing to the advancement in technology, 
what we see is an increase in the use of editing software and camera filters. So my question to you, sir, is uh, does it do justice for the image being captured? And is the authenticity or the natural state of the image being lost according to you? Uh, because in current times, a lot of misinterpretation of false news are just as easily spread due to edited photos. OK, great. Yeah. Uh, can paintings be considered as early form of photography? No, because a painting is a painting. Uh, uh, one someone has to like you know I mean it is the it is the um, like you know someone has to there is an unmediated um, relation between the painter and the painting. The thing about photography is that it is not really um, subsumed. It is not really framed by the intention of the photographer because it is a machine. Because it is not really under your control. Um, I mean, we know that we take we take seven selfies and post one of them to uh, Instagram. What happens to the other six is that everything was ready, but when the photo came out, it didn't look nice. Obviously, it was not in your uh, control. That is precisely, I mean, even the seventh one, which you actually posted was not really, but you know, given the range, that was the best. So this is the this idea of mediation is what makes photography different and what makes photography uh, you know i mean for example how did films uh, come about films came about because someone want to really know uh, how do horses uh, when they run do they lift both all four of their legs or you know are two of them on the ground i mean it was actually a means of ascertaining a reality now the thing is you cannot have this with painting right in the sense that there it is a mechanical process here you have to intent you have to have that intention onto the uh, thing now uh, uh, fake news false news obviously uh, these are not good things but the thing is uh, does it do justice see if photography is a record of aesthetics then i think editing should also be a record of aesthetics uh, on the other hand uh, you know i mean if it is used to see these are uh, mat these are things of ethics matters of ethics in the sense that uh, in a world where you cannot really know what is the truth the only reality that you can go by is that you cannot uh, you have to be um, you have to let the other person live. I mean, this is the idea of ethics. Uh, and it comes about precisely because of these technological changes, because if you look at it, uh, this idea of, uh, this idea of being ethics first rather than epistemology first, like, you know, ethics as the first philosophy happened only in the second half of 20th century. And it is precisely because of technologies and how we do not have, I mean, how we understood that we do not really have this access, unmediated access to reality. So, yeah, I mean, there is no point in us saying that whether it is justified or not justified. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, L. Joe. Uh, ask this question, would you like to comment on the visual text and its connection with a culture of emotions? Yes, uh, like actually this is the, um, this is how uh, anthropology has mostly used photographs. Uh, so photographs for a long time, even in India, uh, maybe even today is used to capture the soul of a person. Uh, which is that, uh, so Christopher Pinney gives this example, like, you know, someone dies in this uh, village in which he is doing field work. Before they do anything to the body, they will ask the photographer to come because this guy did not have a photograph when he was alive. I mean, of this. So before they do the other rituals, they have this family, like, you know, this sons and father, the father is dead, but, you know, sitting as if he is alive and taking a photograph because at that moment of time, the photograph is supposed to capture his soul intact. So a uh, photograph is uh, obviously uh, connected to uh, the life of the soul. I mean, these are culturally connected to the life of the soul. Uh, you also can study um, the culture of emotions by uh, looking at the kind of photographs that are taken. Like, you know, for example, some cultures have photographs associated with funerals. Some uh, cultures do not have uh, photographs. Uh, some cultures, uh, for example, uh, does not allow uh, dead people's photographs to be put anywhere in public. 
so uh, yes, but you know, I mean, we cannot have a, we cannot make any general statement. Of course, these are uh, this requires thick description in order to study. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we have uh, this question from Maitili Sagara. Uh, but the camera is a tool, and like the paintbrush or typewriter or a pen. So, how is one art form more mediated uh, uh, from the than the other? Uh, this is in relation to the question that uh, you had answered earlier. That's a follow up question. Oh, uh, see, in the sense that, um, of course, uh, you know, I mean, it's actually a matter of degree. In the sense that we we know that I mean we know that uh, we make spelling mistakes even though we know the correct spelling, and then Freud would say that you know it is connected to your unconscious. Uh, so all of these there are tools in between yes, but a camera is a much more complicated tool in the sense that if you look at all the early discussions on camera, it is about what is the correct chemical process to use, what is the correct physical angle to use. So it is not. Um, in the sense that it is actually a matter of degree, in the sense that a camera can offer, is, is a much more complicated uh, mediation than uh, you know, a brush or a pen. Of course, it is possible that um, it is possible that you know a painter uh, painted something and there was there was one brush stroke which he did not intend. Uh, but you know, it is very different from uh, developing a photograph and then seeing that actually uh, in this photograph, you can see a person who was not supposed to be there. You know, I mean, these are, these are two uh, qualitatively very different kind of things. But yes, theoretically, um, even a brush is a tool which comes in between. Okay. Uh, we have one question and I think after this, we can take one more question. Because, uh, all right. So we have this question from Grishma. And Grishma, she asked this, is there really a drastic difference between uh, truth in journalistic photographs as opposed to other photographs? Can journalistic photographs be taken as more authentic sources of facts? Uh, OK. Here, uh, the question is, you would have often noticed that some of your friends uh, or even people at your home have suddenly started speaking like uh, people in a television series. Uh, the point is that, you know, uh, in the sense that it is not as if there is reality and then there is photograph of reality. It is also the case that reality often follows how a photograph is, for example, um, how a photograph looks like. Like uh, in the sense that we often, uh, the reality that we see around us is usually um, even otherwise mediated by through the other kinds of things that we see around us. So it's not as if that, you know, I mean, you, it's not as if you turn away your uh, face from the uh, screen and then you see a completely different reality, no. Actually, both of these are, um, they generate the same kind of pattern because they are, uh, you know, they are mutually influencing each other. So yes, no, I mean, journalistic uh, photographs cannot be more authentic sources of facts. Like, you know, in the reality itself is often a photograph. Yeah. Okay. I guess it has to be directed back to you, Shafiq, because I will have to pose this question. How real are you now, right, as you are talking? Because you are, we are also capturing your image, right? Okay, anyway, we have one more question from Jaya, and she asked this, can you explain the civil contract of photography, uh, particularly the part where you suggested that the camera has its own agency or a way of functionality that goes beyond that of the photographer and the subject in the photo? With an example, I guess this would be more clear. Okay. Okay. Um, see, if you, um, that last slide that we had is the uh, figure of a Palestinian mother holding her uh, child in her lap. Now, um, aesthetically, one could read it as an example of this uh, Mother Mary carrying Jesus 
the theater, the quite famous. I mean, there are so many fallen soldiers are represented as that. This what happens in reality is that this woman's uh, house has just been bombed by the Israeli forces. Okay, now, but if you look at the how the photograph is taken, it is completely staged. So the cover of her book, the civil. Um, the civil imagination, not the civil contract of photography. She has a book which came before that. It's called the civil imagination on the ontology of photography. The cover of that book actually shows that the photograph is taken in a studio. So you should not imagine that, you know, I mean, her uh, house got destroyed behind her and she's sitting in front of the house with her, uh, with her uh, child in her lap. No, it is completely staged. But does that make the sorrow any less real? That is the question that she is asking. Now, the thing is, each of these people, now the photo is taken by a very famous uh, photographer. She has her own audience in mind. The Palestinian woman who is sitting there has her own audience in mind. But the thing is, the very simple fact that it has to be staged in a photo is because between these two people, there is the camera. The camera cannot just capture photography anywhere like you know i mean in order to have a photo for example if you if your purpose of having a photo is to actually bring out truths which you otherwise overlook then it has to be at times staged and why does it have to be staged because the reality is inadequate for the camera so that is the idiosyncrasy of the camera which is that the camera does not find the real good enough that you know it wants it to be staged so yeah so this is an example uh, for example like you know this is an example of how camera plays this important role because if the camera was all right i mean if the camera can capture picture anywhere then it could have been right when when her you know i mean when her house was destroyed but that is not the case yeah okay uh, I think we can take one last question. If anybody would like to ask the question, then you can unmute your microphone and ask the question. We'll just open it up for a few seconds uh, before we close. Okay. Nothing, nothing yeah. Yeah, nothing. okay, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hi, if I can. Yes. Hi, Shafiq. Yes, absolutely. Uh, hello, this is hello. Marmata. Hi, from Rome, hello. Italy. So since you mentioned Michelangelo and La Pietà, so I, I've been called into <laughs> intervening. No, I, I don't have any question. Just want to congratulate you and uh, say just that I'm very happy for the way you brought forward the uh, relation between the ethics and the aesthetics of the visual narratives. I think uh, it came uh, across very well. And my... Mm, um, it's not really a question that I have, but more a kind of a comment in the sense that even today we are seeing how difficult it is to actually unpack, you know, and to uh, describe what it means to talk about what is real and what is true. So not this kind of a slippery uh, territory in between reality and truth that I think you have commented very well upon the last picture, you know, the sorrow is real, although the picture is not true, it's staged. So uh, I asked some of my students to attend as well, and I just wanted to thank you very much for this uh, great and lecture. Mara, actually, uh, Mara and I both work on migrant uh, visuals. Um, yeah, so thank you actually yeah, for the comment. I hope you're doing all right. <laughs> Yes, Thanks, Mara. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Better. Okay. All right. So uh, it's been great having you all. Uh, our time is also up, uh, but we will be having these sessions again, definitely. Uh, this, we, I think we're moving into exciting ways of having conversations across borders. So thank you, everyone, for uh, being part of the session. And yeah, have a great day ahead. Cheers, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.